If you have your Bibles, open them to John 8 is where we are on Sunday in our study on Truly, Truly, I Say Unto You. And we're in the 8th chapter. You recall that John recorded this special teaching technique of Jesus and <clears throat> uh, for Messianic doctrines. It becomes, for John, a code for key Messianic doctrines. <clears throat> And in uh, chapter 8 of John, you'll recall that we're in the temple discourse. This is the third of five. John 8 has the third of five temple discourses. These are famous discourses. <laughs> Begins in chapter uh, 7 and goes through chapter 10, as we discussed before. <clears throat> now, in chapter 8, in the third temple discourse... He gives three. He gives three discord. He gives three uh, truly trulys. In verse 34, we studied last week, 51 this week, and uh, 58 next week. Um, so, just bringing you up to speed, this takes place at, in chapter 7, this took place at uh, the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, Jesus went to the Feast of Tabernacles in the middle of the week, in verse 14. And much of his teaching occurred on the last day, verse 37. In the 8th chapter 20, we're told that this took place in what was called the treasure chamber of the temple. So that brings us back up to where we have been in this discussion, just in background. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at four aspects of the first, uh, of, the, of the truly, truly, of a true disciple. Um, look at verse 31. We're going to go from 31 through 38. Uh, Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, <clears throat> let's stop for a minute, and then I'll, I'll, have, I'll have prayer, because I know William gets excited if I don't have prayer about this thing, and I like that, William, about you. Uh, see the word therefore in verse 31? Jesus, therefore. <clears throat> Jesus, that word therefore, always you know, therefore is why for, right? Jesus, therefore, was saying to those who had believed in him. Let's go back to verse 27. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father, Watch in verse 28, he throws the gospel on him. Jesus therefore went, said, when you, when you lift up the Son of Man, that's crucifixion, then you will know that I am he and I do nothing on my own initiative. I speak these things as the Father taught me and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone for I always do the things that are pleasing to him, verse 30, as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. Now what he said in verse 28 is what he's already said in the third chapter, verse 14, about the brazen serpent being lifted up business. So now I'm back to verse 31. Jesus, therefore, was saying to those Jews who had believed him, and here's what he said. He said, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. As truly disciples of mine, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They responded, we are Abraham's offspring and have never yet, meaning since Egypt, that's a reference, they mean since Egypt, we have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you shall become free? Then verse 34, he gives us the truly, truly, or another messianic doctrine. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone, and this is really interesting how he introduces this, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. That's the first point. Listen, what he's doing. He's, he's trying to find common ground to teach truth. Common ground. 
That's the first common ground. He's going to give a second one. The slave does not remain in the house forever, but the son does remain forever. That's the second common ground. Here's the third one. If therefore the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's offspring, racial Jews, yet you seek to kill me, violation of the sixth commandment of the Mosaic law. You seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. And listen, he just said, you say your father's Abraham, but I tell you he's not, because you are trying to violate the very things that they stood for. You're trying to murder me. You're violating the sixth commandment. Now he doesn't say that, but that's what he means. And so he reaches into three common grounds in this truly, truly, I say to you, he tried to reach three common grounds to really push the idea that he established in verse 28. Now we'll need a word of prayer, William. Now we'll need that prayer to figure this out. So let us pray. This is classroom etiquette for us that attend this assembly hour and for those who are with us by internet, we encourage you to, to claim the same etiquette for Bible study. It's a spiritual book for, spirituals, uh, for spiritual people to live spiritual lives. You will know the truth. The truth will set you free. So, classroom etiquette. You can't study it. It's a spiritual book, spiritual people. You can't study it carnal. If you're an unbeliever, the Bible makes no sense to you. You're a natural man. You can't understand the things of God. Only as a spiritual person born again by the Holy Spirit who indwells you in the church age, only then will you ever be able to understand it. For those of us who have been born again because we believe Jesus died for our sins, was buried and raised on the dead the third day, and we believe that for salvation, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, and He is there to teach us, John 14, 26. He is there to teach us the truth of God's Word. Truth will set you free. Set you three, free from so many slave mentality ideas of your life that, in, that put you in bondage. So, 1 John 1, 9 says, here's, here's how you correct carnality or personal sin in your life says, if you confess your sin, it could be mental attitude, sin, sin to the tongue or overt sins. If you confess it, he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. That is essential for Bible study. So I give you a moment through your priesthood of 1 Peter 2 to take care of that business. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way, both by automobile and internet. We pray that they will be good students of the word. They've come to learn in order to live the word of God. And when truth takes root in their life, it will set them free from the cosmic system of this world. A cosmic system of lies and bondages. That's why we're set free. I pray today, Father, many will be set free because they've open the Word of God, and under the ministry of the Holy Spirit has found the challenge of how we can be true disciples and truly free. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are in our title, True Disciples of Jesus Christ. In verse 31, he said, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. In other words, Look, here's what he's telling you. There are disciples and there are true disciples. Now, we learned from verse 27 as we came into verse 31 that there were many during his, his teaching lesson that believed on him. All right? They believed and became a disciple. Became a disciple. But listen... There's a difference in being a disciple and being a true disciple. 
A true disciple is one, it, listen, in verse 31, who abides in my word. Then he is a true disciple. I want to show you something. Go to John 6. In your Bible, turn to John 6. And let me show you what, he, what the conflict is. Let me show you what... And listen, these are people who are attending the Bible class of Jesus Christ. Because listen, it's not the teacher, it's the power of the Word of God. I mean, if you want a, a, a great teacher, it would have been Jesus Christ. It's not about the teacher, it's about the Word. Look at, look at John 6, 6, 6, the mark of the beast. As a result, many of his disciples withdrew and stopped walking with him. Did you get that? Yeah. See, it's possible to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. A disciple of Jesus Christ is a learner. That's what matetis means. He's a learner. But listen, when you stop learning... You stop living. When you stop learning to live, then you stop following Christ. It's just that simple. Because a true disciple is one who abides with the word. Then he's a true disciple. Why? Because he's learning to live it, not learning to learn it. That's important. That's important. That's how you know you've been set free. The things that used to hold you in bondage, the things that used to cause you to get out of, quote, fellowship, right, are no longer doing that because you're walking by faith, not by sight. You're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit, not in the power of the flesh. That's why you've become a true disciple. So we're going to talk about that today. Uh, Mathetis. Mathetis comes from Manthano. Manthano means to learn, to learn. And it depends what you're learning. Everybody learns. You can learn bad things just like you can learn good things. And how do you know you're learning bad things? Because bad things come out. You live bad things. That's how you know. That's what Jesus is trying to explain to them. He's going to say, say, if you're, look what he says down here about a slave. Everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Okay? That, so, listen. You learn to live. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what a true disciple is. I want you to write, I want you to put a circle on your paper. Just somewhere, just stick a circle up there. At the very top of that circle, I want you to write the word learn. Then move to the right like, uh, like, you know, like a clock. Move to the right, halfway out there about 3 o'clock. Write the word live. Then down at the six or there about, write the word teach. And then at nine, write the word ministry. Now you're back to learning. It's a cycle. It's a cycle. And listen, if that cycle is working in your life, you're a true disciple. You're learning it. You're living it. You're teaching it. Ministry comes from it. And other people are learning, and you are too. How many times do you learn more? Do you feel when you prepare a lesson or prepare something to teach somebody, you feel like you've learned more than probably what you're teaching? Right? That's what I'm talking about. 
you learn to live, you live to teach, you teach to have ministry, and then you cycle again. Because you go from 101 information to 201 information to 301 information to 401 as far as education. Now I want to show you something. I want you to go to Hebrews to make sure you say, oh, Ron, I think, I think it would be enough if I just learned to live. Well, that would be quite a bit, but it's not enough. Oh, I, I would agree. If I could just get you to learn the Bible, I'll tell you the people I know who are learning the Bible to live it, they're the people who come regular. The people who don't come regularly, they ain't got it yet. They're disciples, but they're not true disciples because they don't have a, a consistent pattern of growing. If you don't have a pattern on the front side of learning, you don't have a pattern on the back side of living. I can tell you that for sure. When you're spacey on learning, you're spacey on living, and the rest of it's just up for grabs. <laughs> Hebrews, the fifth chapter. Look at verse 12. This applies to your life as a learner to live and to teach. See, that's where I got that. And out of teaching comes great ministry. You know why? Because you're discipling others. When you're a learner, you're a disciple. When you begin to live it, you're a true disciple. A true disciple becomes a teacher of what they know to be true in their life and ministry goes from it it's called discipleship ministry it's a natural flow that ministry may be one on one it may be one on two it may be one on three it may be one on thousands but it's going to happen because Hebrews 5.12 says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers. That's a natural flow from learning, living, teaching, ministry. That ministry is called discipleshipping. <clears throat> it is, a, listen... God will, listen, he will bring people for you to counsel. He will bring people that need a word from you that is absolutely true. And you're able to convey it to them because you know how true it is because you're living it out. It's not hearsay. It's live say. I'm just asking. Because this is a natural natural growth flow. You learn, you live, you teach. Ministry of discipleship comes out and the cycle lives on. You can do this both on a local level. You can do it on a national level. You can do it on an international level. But it ought to be going on. It is called discipleshipping. And listen, just because you're a disciple doesn't mean it's going on. But discipleshipping should be going on in your life. And it ought to be going on on a regular basis, maybe even weekly, where people are asking you for prayer and they're asking you this for that and all of that stuff. You, you, because you've made yourself available, listen, when you begin to learn to live it, your life becomes available to others, even if you don't want it. <laughs> they want it. They want a nibble on your food. You know, could I have just a little piece of that to see if I want a whole piece? Could you just give me a little piece of that pie so I know whether I want to order me a piece? World, listen, the world's full of people who are starved to death. And listen, most of them that I meet are in the church starving. There's a huge ministry to believers today. <clears throat> huge ministry. They're starved to death. And so Jesus is dealing with this. But listen, that little cycle is important to your life. It's the cycle of discipleship. And this church should be all about it. We crank out the word of God here like no business. 
I don't, I don't know what no business means, but you know, I mean a lot. <clears throat> we crank out a whole lot of stuff here. When you look at our whole program going on, and listen, not just me either, I'm talking about a whole lot of people. I mean, Saturday, I had the privilege, every month I meet with the ministers in our church. I met with six of them. And the rest of them were out working. I don't know that we understand just how powerful uh, this little church operation is. I mean, you look around, you go like, well, it don't look like many people. Yeah, but everybody's working. Everybody's going. Everybody's excited. I say everybody, you know, I'm collectively talking. So, in our passage today, we're talking about a Mathano. We're talking about the principle of that. We're talking about Monthetis, a, a, a person who is a, a, a disciple of Christ who has committed his life. You know who a true disciple is? One who has committed himself to the circle you wrote on the top of your paper. Here's point number one. The first of the three truly, truly messianic doctrines out of chapter 8 was taught to new believers. <clears throat> Jesus took this discipleshiping on personal. Right? I mean, listen, he's been picking up disciples since he, oh, he hung out his shingle. Everywhere he goes, he's looking for disciples, is he not? He, he, finds them, he finds them at work. He says, listen, I want you to be my disciple. He finds them on the roadside. I want you to be my disciple. At the drinking fountain, I want you to be my disciple. At the dinner table, I want you to be my disciple. Everywhere he went, Chick-fil-A, I want you to be my disciple. Publix, Costa, Costa Rica, I don't know. Is this cycle working in your life? Listen, you sat here today because somebody discipled you. Somebody discipled you. And listen, not just one time, but worked with you, worked with you, worked with you. So that now you've become a true disciple, a person who learns to live, to be a teacher to those who have a desire to get into that discipleship cycle. It's a wonderful thing. And you know it. It's a wonderful thing. In verse 30 and 31, listen to what Jesus said. He says, as he spoke, the word is laleo. It means to communicate. Now I want to tell you something. This word doesn't mean to speak as such. It means to communicate. And to communicate means you've got a listener and a teacher that, want, that both of them want to learn. You've got a student, you've got a teacher, and both of them are interested in the learning process. When that goes on, when the student and the teacher click in a subject matter, communication goes on. Learning takes place. That's what he's talking about. That's the word laleo. Laleo. A student is is come to class with his ears wide open, ready to learn, and the teachers come to class with a lot to give them. And what takes place is amazing. Is amazing. And there, there begins this cycle that you wrote on your paper. This is what... The, this is where this cycle begins. If you're not willing to be a student, that cycle will never go. You've got to bring ears to hear and a heart to believe or it doesn't take place. I can come here and you can come here, but for communication that goes, goes on, you've got to have ears to hear and I've got to have something to put in them. It's not about personality. It's not about skill. It's about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. 
as he spoke, present active participle, as he continued communicating these things, many came to believe. Prasuo, aorist active indicative, third person, many. It's a transitive verb, Pastuo in the indicative is a transitive verb. Therefore, the merit lies in the faith, in the object of the faith. What is the object of the faith? Say, well, we already know from verse 28. When he popped them with the prophetic gospel, they, many believed. Many believed in him. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed, now watch what he did. Those who had believed are now, listen, when they believed, they were in the present active and, and uh, participle. Now, now that they have believed, it's a perfect active participle. Isn't that interesting? It was an aorist active indicative I'm sorry, it was an aorist active indicative when they believed. Now it's a perfect active participle. The, listen to me. The perfect participle completes, listen to me now, completes the action of the main verb. The main verb was an aorist active indicative to believe. A perfect participle completes that action. In other words, the person who believes the gospel is a believer is a believer, is a believer, a perfect tense, forever. The perfect tense is forever. When you believe the gospel, that faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, salvation is forever. That's the perfect tense, completed in the past when you believe, with the result, it remains completed forever. That act of faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ is what stabilizes you because the gospel, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. And for by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. Grace through faith is Ephesians 2.8.9. Therefore, God... God Almighty puts your faith in the perfect tense. He locks it up and seals it. Locks it up and seals it. Don't let people tell you any different. You go with the word of God. That's a perfect active. The active voice is the voice of volition. The voice of volition that goes with believing. Those who have believed are believers. You will always be one, whether, whether you act upon it again or not. The act that made you, took you, when you became a believer, God sealed that, a believer in what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Your salvation is secured. You know, phase one, salvation. Phase two, the Christian life. Phase three, you know, eternal life. Phase one is done. That's the perfect tense. That deal is done. There'll be no more phase one for you. Now it's all about phase two and three. Phase one is a locked deal. That's the perfect tense. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? That ought to be. Jesus said it. That ought to be, that ought to be good for us, all right? Now I want to show you two things. First, I want to show you the witness of the cross in verse 28. Then I want you to show I want to show you five things to know from it. In verse 28, 9. Watch this. Verse 28. When he said to them, when, that's a point of time, when you lift up the Son of Man, that's a that's the Messiah who dies on a cross. That's that's the prophetic Messiah who's got to die on a cross. The Son of Man. That's, that's the, he, bear, he bore our sins on his flesh on the cross. You know, that 1 Peter 2.24. That's what he's call, talking about. The Son of Man. When you, Jews, lift up the Son of Man, then. See, those are time. When, then. Those are time. When this happens, 
this, right? They're timed. It's based on timing. When you lift up the Son of Man, then. That, that's hotan tote. They're timing. You got to have this to have this. When this happens, this will happen. Okay. <laughs> I know. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know, that is, in time, time factors, you will know, future, middle, indicative, that. Here are five things you will know. Here are five things you will know. Five things. You will know, you will know, future, middle, indicative, future from salvation. You will know, and this is what you look for, that, one, I am He. He's Christ, that I am, I am Christ the Messiah. I am He. Later, He's going to say, I am that I am, and it's really going to drive nuts. I, I am He. Then you will know. You remember the woman at the well? And they got, through, they, they got into all kinds of discussion. He just stayed patient with her. And finally, she goes like, I got, I, I'm, a thinking, I, I'm just thinking that maybe you're the prophet and he went what, uh, uh, one grade above I, I have a higher grade than that and she went damn the Messiah and went cha-ching remember that I, I, I put it in my own language but. <laughs> yeah yeah you know what he told her he said I, I'm him I'm the guy. Da, 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 da. I'm the guy. And she went back to the city and said, he's here. Come see the Messiah. Say, I am he. One, I am he. Two, I do nothing on my own initiative. Oh, listen to what he's about to tell him. Listen, you're going to hang me up on the cross. It's going to be okay with the Father. It's okay with me. If it's okay, listen, whatever you do with me, if it's okay with the Father, it's okay with me. That's quite a day when you get to that place in your life when you can say, Father, whatever your will is, is okay with me. And what you're looking at, take your breath away. Right? What you're looking at, Job, would take your breath away. But if this is your will... And I believe it is. Then I'm going to ride the storm because I know where the storm comes from and where the calm comes from. Let the storm rage and let the calm be here. Hmm? Let me tell you, Christ, before, when the storm was there in Gethsemane, whew, but listen, when he's on the cross, he was just as, as calm as a cucumber or calm as a, I don't know, calm as something. I went back to my roots quick, didn't I? Right there. I, I do nothing on my own initiative. Three, but I speak, communicate these things as the Father taught me. See how that, see how that cycle works with him? He's in that cycle, just like in ours. And he, four, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. You know how comforting that is? Listen. He has never, he, listen, he looked in the rearview mirror. He has never left me alone. Not one time. So what can I conclude from that? He, he Listen, he will never leave nor for, for, forsake me, right? Can we not conclude that? Listen, many times when you're struggling in the present, it looks overwhelming. Look back to what God has done in your life and let that be comforting who will carry you through. Wouldn't that be good? See, he just did that. He just did that. He said, that's a principle of life for me. Five, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Always. Not sometimes. See, a true disciple that's walking the walk of the word of God out in his life as he's learned it, this is, th this is his motto. This is his motto or her motto. Listen, they, listen, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. You know, you know what pleases him? For example, in Romans, the fifth chapter, faith. 
Without faith, it's impossible to please him. You know where faith comes from? Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. Uh, Romans 10, 17. You want to please God? Of course, who doesn't want to please God? They be children of his word. Be children of his word. Learn it. Live it. Teach it. Disciple. Disciple. Disciple people. You know, people call me all the time. <clears throat> they say, will you come and hold a Bible study? That's like, would you pray for me? You know what I say? I say first, well, let's, let's talk a moment. Because you know who ought to be holding a Bible study in, in your house? Do you know who should be holding a Bible study in your house? Do you know who should be holding a Bible study in your house? The one who's been holding Bible studies in your house is you. You've been teaching whoever comes in. You've been teaching your family. You've been teaching your dog. Any preacher that's got a dog or a cat preaches more sermon than them, probably the congregation. Now, I'm not opposed to going out there and helping you. I'm not opposed to that idea. I tell you what I think. I'm disturbed by that idea. How long have you been sitting in the Word of God? Do you not have five or six basic doctrines in your soul that, that have been important to you that you could teach others? You don't have to teach him for the rest of your life. Teach him for how many you can disciple. I'll feed you information. Go to our website. Listen, there's enough material there to, for the last you five lifetimes. <laughs> Jeez. I'm not opposed to you. So do you have anybody send you? Yeah, we've got a lot of guys we could send to you. Why would we be sending them to you? Why would we do that? You could go to Chuck Farmer's material. He's got, I don't know, we just went through it, about 16 lessons in that from basics to advanced, which is basic. You got 16 weeks right there, all written out, all done, all you got to print them off, hand them to the people, and just read. My <laughs> goodness. Listen, stop being lazy and passing it off to somebody else. Well, I don't have the gift. I'm not talking about gifts, I'm talking about discipleshiping. You can get together for football games. You can get together for wedding rehearsals and get together for baby showers and all kinds of stuff, and you can't get... Oh, come on. How is it that you can have a gathering for anything but the Bible? Stop being lazy. Well, I'd rather have somebody else do it. Stop being lazy. Nobody could do it better than you. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I can do that. Yes, you can. Did you raise kids? Did you raise kids? You're the best teacher in the whole wide world. Five things. Five things, he said. Here are five things. These are the things a true disciple need to launch. Listen, here are some things you need to believe about Jesus Christ to be, to be a true disciple, a disciple who goes to learn, to live, to teach, to have ministry of discipleship. The first people you should disciple are people in your periphery. You should disciple your wife and your husband. You should disciple your children, your in-laws, your outlaws, everybody you're connected to. You know what I do? I have barbecues. Listen, my people will come to meals, then teach them. After a while, they get onto it, but then you have to change up to special meals like Mexican or something. I 
I mean, how bad is that? Well, you know, they, they know if they come, they're going to get some teaching. Well, good for them. My Uncle Glenn, every time he came to the house, I gave him the gospel. I gave him a piece of pie, a cup of coffee, and the gospel in that order. And while he was eating the pie and enjoying it and bragging on Jane, I popped him with the gospel. And you know what kept him coming back? Jane's pie. I don't apologize for that. My uncle got saved. About six pies later. <laughs> I got so tired of apple pie, I could have choked. He never complained about it. Others might complain about it, but he never did because he loved apple pie. In the end, he came down to the house without the apple pie being a tease, just to come and have Bible study with me. Because when he got saved, I said, you need to come down and, and give me 30, 40 minutes a, a week so I can teach you some things, okay? Okay, what's Jane going to cook? After a while, it didn't matter. Oh, you say, that's because you're a preacher. No, it wasn't. It was because I was a disciple. I was a true disciple of Jesus Christ. It wasn't, because, it wasn't because of that. I didn't even know what I was doing at that time other than being a disciple. I had no idea I was going to wind up here. Just like you. You didn't, you, you didn't think you'd wind up here either. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> Jesus encouraged these new believers to become true disciples. He had just had experience in the 6th chapter, verse 6-6, so Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed on him, if, third class condition, you continue mental, aorist, active, subjunctive, in my word, then, see now I got it again. You got the if and the then. Do you see that? If you have this, then this is, if, if you continue in my word, then you are true disciples of mine, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And when that happens, ministry opens up your life. Your life opens up to ministry to others when that happens. Listen, nobody who remains in bondage ever shares the Bible with anybody. You know what I mean? They don't have the courage in them to tell other people how to live when they can't, and the other people bring it, bring it out and slap them with it, don't they? Well, you're a fine one to tell me how to live. I am because I know the truth. I'm struggling with it, but I know the truth. Be honest with them. I hear that too. Who are you? Right? People who know you. Which is a good reminder to get your life shaped up. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't share them the truth when the truth comes, but it does mean that they're watching you. They don't see the fruit in you. They don't see the reason why they would give up that to follow you and what you believe in because it doesn't seem to be working for you. Am I talking to anybody today but me? So Jesus was saying to those believers who believe, if you continue, aorist, active, subjunctive, the aorist tense puts us at a point in time when they believe. Now it's time to become a true disciple. You are a disciple because you're saved. Now become a true one. You've got to stick your head into the Word of God. And listen, you know what the act of voice means? It's a choice. It's a choice daily. Quiet time. We call it quiet time. It's a choice every day. It's a choice every day. But every day in your life... 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 ought to be working. Every day of your life it ought to be working. There's a formula that I want to share with you. Knowledge of Bible doctrine plus the filling teaching ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit equals truth that makes 
free disciples, true disciples, true disciples. It makes you spiritually free in a world of cosmos diabolical thinking that opposes the truth of the word of God. It frees you up from that. Frees you up from the lies. That's a formula. And it's, listen, that formula is discussed in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. You need to pay attention to that. And the formula principle is categorical Bible doctrine cycled into the soul becomes spiritual truth that makes the believer spiritual free. That's that daily intake, either inhale, exhale. Every day, the Word of God needs to be going in or coming out or both. You know, I was thinking about this one day when Jane was having really breathing problems. She, 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 we had her in the hospital, and she was having breathing problems. And I would catch myself. I would say to her, just calm down and breathe out. She would panic a little bit, and they would, everybody would try to teach her to breathe through your nose, breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. Was that right, Diana? Breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And it calms you down when you do that. And so everybody and all the girls and all of us in our family, our family kids, we all worked that on her. But as soon as she would panic, she would start breathing out of her mouth and her, and her panic would increase. And so the nurses came in and said, look, th th there's a way you do this and it calms yourself down. You breathe through your nose and out your mouth, not in your mouth and out your nose. So if you keep doing that. And, I've, I, and I thought to myself, as I sat there and I watched that, and then we, we all worked it on her all the time because she would do that and she would instinctively go back to a, a, a bad routine. She would panic and go back to a bad routine. She would get desperate and, and instead of calm down and do this exercise. And I thought to myself, you know, that's the way, that's exactly what 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 is about. There are times in our life when, when the episode is so strong in what we're dealing with, it, quote, takes our breath away. And what we have to do is we have to go back to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We have to go back into that calm place in Christ and begin to cycle that word of God in our life, right? We need to breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. Well, I've got as far as I can get today. I just really blew through that first point, did I? Well, the rest is for you. <laughs> I hope you will study it because there's a lot of good information in there. How many points did I have, Al? Four? I was really ambitious, wasn't I? Let's have a word of prayer. Let's see. Uh, okay. Let's pray. This is for our offering for those who are with us today. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way to study with us and finance our, our, our ministry. I, I don't mean just this hour. This hour, I mean, it's the, it's the 24 hours of a day multiplied by seven. That is where the huge ministry is in this church. And I'm thankful, Father, for those who contribute to that ministry both on a local scale and on an international scale with, with missionaries out there. So I pray that it's not the amount. It's never the amount. It's the attitude of the heart. We live in the church age. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And it doesn't matter the amount. It matters about the attitude. The widow's might was scored high on the chart of giving it was because of her heart her attitude her attitude towards God was not about money was not about getting it was about giving I pray we would have that heart because we know when we have it money goes so much further because of the grace of God for we've made our prayer in Jesus name Amen